Κόντρα News. Επιστρέφουμε και στο σημείο αυτό θα πάμε να παρακολουθήσουμε την αποκλειστική συνέντευξη που είχαμε με τον Ρότζερ Βότερ προχθέ το βράδυ, προχθέ τα μεσάνυχτα. Την αποκλειστική συνέντευξη εδώ στον Κότρα. Μαζί με εσά θα την παρακολουθήσουμε και εμεί από το στούντιο με τον Πέτρο Παπακοσταντίνου. Και μόλι ολοκληρωθεί, θα τη σχολιάσουμε. So you are in, uh, in the middle of a uh, uh, tour in uh, Latin America. Uh, right now you are uh, sitting in uh, your hotel in Peru, right? And uh, you have a concert uh, tomorrow night. This is the last concert. This is the last part of the concert. Okay, then, then in it, hotel if there. So you uh, still remember some of your Greek uh, words? Just a little, no. Thymame Merikis Lexis, Aftoina, I bet. Not a lot. It's been many years. It's not the last tour. The last tour, it's the last but three. After Lima, mm -hmm. we go to Bogota and then Quito in Ecuador. And I think that's it. Then we'll be done. So we're nearly finished. Your concerts are uh, in the middle of, uh, in, the, in, the, in the center of uh, the foreign uh, media, in the, in the center of the interest of the foreign media. Because mostly of your political stance, because mostly of uh, uh, the way that you are approaching the international uh, issues, one of the issues is the Palestinian issue and uh, the war at, that right now it's uh, taking place in uh, in Gaza. Can I yeah. have uh, your first comment on uh, on the war in Gaza and the attack of uh, the Hamas military group on the outskirts of Gaza Strip? Um. Well, it's a long story is the most important thing. This is a story that's been going on since uh, three quarters of the way through the 19th century, uh, when the whole notion of Zionism started. And it, and it carried on through the beginning of the 20th century, and it grew and then it waned. And most of the Jewish people in the world were very against the idea of Zionism, and maybe still are. We're not sure about that yet. But the fact is that um, in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, um, the Zionist idea was pushed forward very strongly, not just by the UK government, but by the government of the United States as well. And, uh, and it grew until the overthrow of the British mandate, in which, and that, that movement started in the, in, during the war, in fact. And, and the terrorist groups, the Zionist terrorist groups in Israel were very, very active by the end of the Second World War. In fact, the, in fact, the first big uh, massacre was at the King David Hotel, I believe, in 1946, when 81 people were killed by the Ergun gang, who, who were part of the movement to overthrow the British mandate and, and, uh, and create the state of Israel. And they succeeded in that endeavor uh, in 1948. Uh, VAR movements through the UN, supported again by the French and the English and the Americans and so on. And that is the beginning of the story that we all know of what is called wrongly the conflict uh, in Palestine. As you know, Palestine was a large piece of land that was controlled by the British under the British mandate um, from, well, the end of the First World War until the end of the Second World War. Um, so th so this, is, this is the story. So it's an old story. It's 75 years old, this particular bit of the story. And it is the story of a settler colonialist enterprise to take over the land where, uh, unfortunately and sadly, other people were living who were not of the Jewish faith and who were considered others by the people who were the leaders of the Zionist movement. We're mincing histories here. And I am not an historian. I'm a musician. I do have political feelings and I'm a human being. And, and the, the only the reason people are taking notice of my shows and things is because I actually scribbled it on a piece of paper while you were talking. It's that, can you read that word? It says resist. So my shows are all about resisting the ruling class and the status quo 
politically that we, all of us, every human being on the planet lives under. Because that status quo is very, very destructive for every individual on it, with the possible exception of one or two very, very wealthy people, or maybe even a hundred very, very wealthy people all over the world who it benefits. But the status quo does not benefit ordinary people. It doesn't benefit you or me or we the people. In fact, it is killing us all. But within the specific context of Palestine and Israel, the Holy Land, all the, all the land from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea, all of that place, with, within the context of that, it is killing them a lot faster than it is killing us at the moment. So that is why we're focusing our attention on Gaza at the moment, because the Israeli government is committing genocide on the people of Palestine all, well, not just at this moment, because there's a pause, there's a ceasefire in the genocide, or, but they're going to start it again in a couple of days. And they're absolutely, um, the intent they have all expressed in the cabinet, in the Netanyahu cabinet, is to wipe out the Palestinians or to move them into the Sinai desert so they can die there. And so that the Israeli government can take over Gaza and, I don't know, build a golf course with Donald Trump or whatever they decide to do with it. So this is what we're faced in. I just went for a walk here in Lima because I have to exercise. Whenever I see a small child, when I'm walking the street, part of me, part of my brain wants to go, look at that cute kid in those, you know, whatever. We saw one just now, walking down a sidewalk in Lima, wearing a little karate outfit. Oh, look at that cute kid. All I can see is that guy with the two plastic bags with the bits of his child in them, with a foot sticking out. And I'm happy to say that I read this often, that there are millions and millions of ordinary people over the world who that's all they can see. They cannot get the image of the monstrous bombing of Gaza that's been going on for 42 days or 45, I have, I've lost count of the days. And the dead children under the rubble, they cannot get that image out of it. And it's a good thing because it's only the masses of people all over the world. It needs for them to all resist and to all rise up and to all voice their opinion that this is disgusting and that it is being done in their name because their governments in the United States and France and Germany, most of Europe, in fact, and Australia and New Zealand and Canada are all 100% behind the Israeli genocide of the Palestinian people. And we, the people of England and the United States and most of the rest of the world, say, no, it has to stop. Roger Water is a huge name. I mean, Roger Water is a star. Uh, on the other hand, Roger Water has a, a, a political presence. Uh, it, it, he's a, a political activist. So all these things, all your political stance, it has a cost, I mean, on what you are doing, on your job. Yeah, it does have a cost because people don't, you know, not everybody believes in the validity and the precious nature of equal human rights. Mm -hmm. The Israelis don't. When I say the Israelis, I don't mean all Israelis, obviously. Some, some Israelis, some the Jewish people who live in Israel, they don't all believe in genocide. The government does. The right wing, the settler colonialist end of the Israeli state believes in genocide. But not all Israelis do. They're wonderful, lovely people. A lot of them are very good friends of mine. They believe in the same things that I believe in, I hope you believe in, and Richard Falk believes in. They believe in equal human rights for all our brothers and sisters, blah, 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 blah. We can say it over and over again. They don't believe in that. They believe in the supremacy, their supremacy. They believe that they are superior. This is the Israeli cabinet. They believe they're superior 
to Palestinian people. They believe, because they've said so. I'm not making this up. They've said this. I let Shakar, the ex-minister of something or other, calls them little snakes and says that women who are pregnant with little snakes who are growing, going to grow up to be Palestinians should be shot, killed, eradicated, eliminated. This is, this is not, a, not a laughing matter. And it's not something that's going to go away. They will always believe this. They have to be told by the rest of us, not a mass. You cannot do this. These are our brothers and sisters. There is only one race, and it's the human race. And we're all African in origin. We know this because of all our research into the genome. We, we're only you smile. We're all African. And we should understand that we're all cousins. It doesn't matter if you're Greek or Egyptian or Ethiopian or South African or Maori or Aboriginal or white Australian or whatever. We're all cousins i know that uh, or i listen you will tell me if it's correct or no i i heard about the concert in london that you got quite a lot of pressure not to come out with palestinian flag or to make any political uh, statements i don't know if it uh, if it's true if it's correct if it's right uh, on the other hand i'm trying to imagine during a war time in gaza and uh, having this uh, tour in uh, latin america you face this kind of uh, pressure in, uh, uh, in your concerts. It's, it's an issue that is on the table most they of the times that you have to go out. They do it behind my back. If I hear about somebody trying to take a Palestinian flag off anybody coming into my concert, I get a bit noisy. <laughs> because mm -hmm. no, But yeah, but the, the Israeli lobby, it's not the Jewish lobby. It's not the Jewish. There were a lot of people in the Israeli lobby, in the diaspora, as in in South America, are of the Jewish religion. But that doesn't mean it's it's an Israeli lobby. It's a Zionist lobby that wants to silence me. And they're very powerful. They own a lot of stuff and they do everything they can to make life difficult for me. But they can't stop me. They've tried. They went to court in San Diego, just now. They went to court in Buenos Aires to try legally to prevent me from performing my concert. And they, their cases are thrown out of court. They did it in Germany, in Cologne, and in Frankfurt. They went and tried to get my um, concert banned. Some idiot, I've forgotten his name now happily, but a member of parliament stood up in parliament in London where I'm from and tried to get my concerts in London and Manchester banned. This is all the work of the Israeli lobby. Well, I'm a lot harder to get rid of than Jeremy Corbyn, I'm happy to say. They got rid of Jeremy Corbyn, not just because he supported Palestinian rights. He supports all human rights for everybody. He's a really good man. But also, he represents the needs of the working class in England. That's why the ruling class in England colluded with the Israeli lobby in ways that, if you want to know about it, just watch the Al Jazeera documentaries. There are two, The Lobby UK and The Lobby USA, and they're both very good documentaries, and they leave nothing to the imagination. But, as we've learned, this is the way politics works. It, when they decide, they, the ruling class, decide what they want, mainly profit, that's mainly what they want, and they want to go on profiting from other people's work, okay? So they'll do anything to maintain the status quo that supports neoliberal capitalism. So we are living in the mess that was created by Milton Friedman in the Chicago School of Economics and by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, and the burgeoning of all that through the 80s and 90s been supported by Clinton and every other president in the United States that's come since. And we are faced with this now, with a huge disparity between the very, very wealthy and ordinary people is growing massively every day until it's almost impossible for ordinary people to make the sums add up at the rest of the month. So more and more of them find themselves homeless, destitute, through no fault of their own. You know, the awful idea that the ruling class tries to sell is they should have worked harder. Are you insane? Most of these people have got two jobs. They work all day and night 
trying to scrape a living. But they can't because Jeff Bezos has got $200 billion or whatever. It's crazy. The whole thing is crazy. Very difficult to organize them, to write, to resist. They have to resist. They've got to resist it. They have to be vocal about it. And it's hard. I'm reading here one of uh, uh, your interviews, the past interviews. For the war in Ukraine, you said that Russia's invasion was not unprovoked. So the same thing it is claimed by Israel for Gaza, for example, and plenty of the people, as I see on the social media, uh, they are mentioning, mentioning that you are using different uh, standards on how you are reading uh, the facts. Different standards about what? What are they talking about? First of all, nobody, not, I'm sure you would not disagree, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was provoked. Can we all agree on that? Hugely provoked for about 15 years. I am not using double standards. I am using, I'll say it again, I repeat it ad nauseum. I believe in equal human rights for all my brothers and sisters all over the world, including Palestine, including Israel, whatever, notwithstanding their ethnicity or religion or nationality. That is the platform I stand on. That is the same standard for everywhere in the world. Let, let me stay a bit, uh, a bit more in Ukraine. Let me stay a bit in the past. I mean, the, the, the rest of the Pink Floyd, the former uh, partners, uh, yeah. and specifically, if I'm not wrong, it was uh, uh, Nick Mason and uh, David Gilmore, that they That's brought out, uh, they brought up a, a, a new song uh, during the, the time of the war in uh, Ukraine, and after a long period of absence. So the name of the song, it was... Uh, Hey, hey, rise up, if I remember well, I think, yeah. Uh, can, can I ask how you felt uh, when you first listened to uh, the song? I, f I felt very sad. Um, and very depressed. I was miserable that the name of the band that both Nikki and I were in when we, when we started the band together was being used in that way. Uh, it was about the time when... The Minsk Accords were being agreed to in uh, Turkey, in, in Istanbul. And they had reached an agreement, Zelensky had reached an agreement with Vladimir Putin. This was in March 2022. And the war was within a hair of being over then. And they would have had to iron out the detail. And then the Americans sent Boris Johnson in and they got him in a corner and said, no. We're going to and that was the end. And they're still killing Ukrainians now. So when when the remnants of Pink Floyd did that, then I was very, very sad. But they don't read as much as I do. Neither Dave nor Nikki does. And so, and at the time, everywhere was blue and yellow flags. People seemed to believe. They believed. Um, the mantra that was being sung to them, that there was a big evil Russia that was gobbling up this poor little innocent, freedom-loving uh, democracy of the Ukraine. Well, you can only believe that if you don't read anything and if you didn't know the history and you didn't know the history of the 2014 Maidan coup, which anybody who reads now knows was a coup, an illegal coup against a democratically elected government. And the, and the Ukraine was probably very corrupt before that, but since then it's totally corrupt, the country. And all those Korean boys and men and women are dying on the altar of American foreign policy. It's a proxy war. It's not a war between Russia and Ukraine. It's a war between the United States of America and Europe, NATO, and Russia. It's a proxy. The Ukrainians are the victims. And to fly their flag and be sending them weapons so they can die. And they're almost all dead now. The war is over in the Ukraine. We all, everybody recognizes that. It's a question of what to call it, how to discover the words to make it not seem as if somebody's lost, to not make it. 
from your point of view and my point of view, to not have it turn into the Third World War. But it's a disaster for Europe. And what it, what's it encouraging in Europe? Fascism. Because when you destroy countries economically, what you do is you make it much easier for people like this guy in Argentina who's just been elected president, Milei, right, who seems... Well, we'll see. We'll see what he does. What is, what is your reading for the rise of the of the far right in uh, in Europe and in the rest of the world, in Argentina, for example, uh, in Latin America? But in Europe, we see it more and more often. Well, I think it's a direct result of the capitulation of the ordinary people of Europe and the United States of America, because all of this devolves me and Great Britain certainly where I come from, to neoliberal capitalism. They've bought the great lie that neoliberal capitalism is good for you, that wealth filters down. I hope they're beginning to see, and I know the people in Greece are, that wealth does not filter down. Once they've got their grip on it, the ruling class, they bloody well keep it, and they make sure none of it filters. The problem is that at the, bottom of, at the bottom of the pile, when there is no education, there's no health service anymore, there's no social services, there's, not, there's, not, there's no safety net at the bottom of society. We stop looking after people. That at the end of that, you get 1933 Germany. That's what you get. And we all know what happens after that. And you get the rise of the demagogic fascist leader, the guy I used to play in the wall, you know, before they tried to have me locked up for railing against fascism and railing against the Third Reich and railing and pointing out the terrible dangers that come at the bottom of the slippery slope that starts with an acceptance of neoliberal capitalism as the basis for the way society works. When profit is the... When profit becomes the thing you put on the altar and bow down to and pray to in the evening before you go to sleep, that's the very slippery slope that leads to Adolf Hitler. So one or two more questions. Uh, the first one, I uh, remember that in the past with uh, the Pink Floyd, the old Pink Floyds, I mean, when you were uh, all together, uh, you had an a house in uh, in Greece, if I'm not wrong, in Pilio, and you were visiting often uh, Pilio and uh, in Greece. From that uh, days and uh, from this house, what left behind? The house still exists. Somebody has the keys still still coming here. Υπάρχει ακόμη. Mm-hmm. Το σπίτι εκεί. No. And who in has a, the keys? I love that house. I love the village. I won't mention the village because I don't want. The village up the hill is called Argalasti. And I'm, I'm, I am close to the people of uh, from there and from the Pelion. I learned a lot from those people through the 70s. Now, last time I was there was maybe two years ago. I spent several weeks there in the summer. I love it there on the beach, on the Corpus Pagasidikos. A key in there. I was in a philosophy. Yanni Sidro because he worked as a blacksmith. One day, I remember this even now, and my Greek is very bad, but one day he said, Roger, Otani Mastimikri, Efegami, Olamaji, in a trapezi, in a piati, Olamaji, Efegami metaxeria mas. He said, and he said, K. And I thought, I remember him saying, nobody was ever sick. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because we were sitting together around a table, eating with our hands from one plate. And I've never forgotten that. And they were always very proud of the fact that everything was autocracy in the doppio. Everything is top here. Roger, how much time, all in all, how much time you spend in Greece? I mean, it was a few months, it was a few years. If you calculate it together, I it was what? Yeah, but for many summers, I would stay for a couple of months in the summer, you know. So, 
It's, it's amazing that you still remember uh, the Greek language. A little bit. You can bit. still make a phrase, you can still understand things. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, nobody spoke any English, so I, I had to learn to speak mm -hmm. English, and, and I did a little bit, you know. I remember once going to uh, Volos to buy uh, carbon. Also in the tequila, you know. <laughs> and I had this conversation, haggling with the guy. And after a bit, he said to me, "Deni ne apodosi." And I went, "Oh, apoputi, Athena." And I went, "Oh, he Anglo, he man." How is it? How is it to be anonymous between other people? How is it to be in a village and uh, not to be recognized? Most of our life I have been. It's not till social media. These last two or three years of touring the people, because back in the early days of Pink Floyd, I was always very careful about, you know, I, I, I did a cover for Rolling Stone once, but I did it when the wall came out, but I did it with one of the wall masks on. So it's two black eyes. The, the only thing you can see is this ring. If you ever see that Rolling Stone, that's the only way you know it's me, is because of this ring, which I've had since 1968. So, yeah. it's not, but it's nice. But people are nice. You know, when I see people in the street, they're very, they're normally very, very polite and, and you know, unkind. And I try and stop and be polite as I can back to them as well. So, I, 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 I really enjoy the love that I feel from people and, and at my gigs as well. And they are beginning to understand that my gig is only about resistance. Sure, I play Us and Them, but Us and Them is an anthem of resistance. It's an explanation. That's why I remade the record um, Dark Side of the Moon. Now, on the 50th anniversary, I've made a new version, completely new version called Dark Side of the Moon Redux. And I made it because it's actually a very powerful piece of writing. And I wrote it when I was 29 years old and I remade it when I was 79. So it's my daughter, when I played it, she said, it's beautiful, Dad. He, she said, and it's it's the 29 year old you and the 79 year old you looking back across the 50 years since when you wrote it and when you've remade it. And yet the story, uh, the message, which is that we only get one chance at life. So it behoves us to listen to Yanni Sidro and to love the people of Calamos. There, I said the word. Or, and, and, and to reach out with every beat of our heart to our brothers and sisters and express our love to them. And when we see some of our brothers and sisters going completely wrong, like the government in Washington, D.C., or the Israeli government, completely insanely wrong, um, it's, it behooves us to say, you've got this completely wrong, brother. You know, I wish I could explain it to you. I probably can't, but I am going to non-violently resist the dreadful things that you're doing to this beautiful planet, because I love it. And I love all my brothers and sisters on it. And so, so the fight goes on. So my last question, uh... Yourself, uh, Stella, and uh, Yanis Varoufakis, you are one of the few people that you are still visiting uh, Julian Assange. So it was September, uh, end of September, if I'm not wrong, that you visit him in uh, Belmar's prison. It was. A few words about the meeting and uh, if you are optimistic about uh, the future of, uh, of Julian. It was very, it was very moving meeting Julian. I'd never met him before. It was September the 30th. And I'd never met the boys before. I'd met Stella a few times. My next job today is I've been sent a cable. Mm -hmm. It's one of the cables that WikiLeaks released. And it's a cable I've never seen. And it's a cable from 2006 in Iraq. <laughs> And it is a cable from a rapporteur from the United Nations um, Committee of Human Rights. And he is writing to somebody in the US government and he calls them your excellency. So it's probably an ambassador or something. And he's, explain, he's describing to them how the US army or the 
the multi something or other force that they used to call it something a multinational force mm-hmm. went into a house in Tigrid where there were a family living a man his wife four children a cousin and somebody else all right claiming that a shot had been fired from inside we don't know whether it had or not they went round the house and they handcuffed them all and then they shot them all dead through the head and left them he's writing a cable to the americans saying um, we've had these reports, it's confirmed by the mortuary in Tigrit and the blah, 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 this did actually happen and da, 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 da. And are you aware of the um, regulations regarding war and what you're allowed to do and what, and that you've, uh, and what you're going to do about it? And of course, they never heard anything back. But WikiLeaks um, published that cable. So I've been asked to react to it. So I just did. So you go, no wonder they're trying to kill him. Because we deserve, we deserve to know if US and UK and Australian and whoever, the, whoever they were who did it are going into people's private houses in foreign countries, handcuffing children and shooting them through the head and women and men and, ch- and whatever, not just the children. They didn't single the children out. There were four children between the ages of 12 and four or something. But they still shot them all in the head and left them dead in the head. We have a right to know that because they're acting in our name. And there were millions, not millions, but probably a million of those all over Iraq for all those years between 2003, what was it, March 2003, and whenever whenever they finally kicked them out, it was going on. And it was all illegal from the first second, as we know. It was all based upon the same kind of lies that the war in Ukraine was based upon. Same lies, exactly. They make up the lie and then they have a war. And they make millions and millions and millions of dollars out of the war. And innocent Ukrainians or innocent Iraqis die. And it's the world that we live in, and we have to resist it. That's all. So that's that's my next job this afternoon, is to make a video thing of that. And you may see it somewhere, because I know Stella will give it to the book, and they will edit it a bit and use it. How to make sense out of it, I've no idea. Because the great worry is that the Americans will snaffle Julian away from under our noses by rushing him through a quick court procedure and he's supposed to have one more hearing in London and it's supposed to be in front of two judges and it's supposed to be in public that's what worries them is the in public idea because Craig Murray among many others will be there and be watching what they do because the last appeal which was Jonathan Swift was the single judge who was there, was a complete farrago. It was a complete waste of time. He'd written a judgment on a scrap of paper, almost on the back of an envelope, just saying, none of this is relevant, take the prisoner down. That was it. So there's an absolutely, there's no recourse in, in the United Kingdom of Rishi Sunak there is no recourse to the law. There is no law for Julian Assange, because if there was, he would have been a free man. He'd have been a free man for at least three years since he finished this silly sentence of a year for a bail infringement, which is the only crime that he has committed under UK or any other kind of law. This is all made up by the Americans. Because he's an inconvenience. Honestly, I wish you good luck with the new project. Uh, Roger Waters, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this uh, interview. I know that your time is precious, especially when you are in uh, between concerts uh, in Latin America right now. So I really appreciate and I thank you for that. Okay, go. Thank you very much.